Next week, uh, August 11, is the Pathfinder Camporee. And so we will meet and uh, we'll be showing a video. Um, it won't be directly related to the creation seminar, but it will be on God or nature or something like that. So uh, remember that one next week. And finally, uh, if you have questions, well, thank you, Jeremy. If you have questions, what I would suggest that you do is write them on a piece of paper so that you don't forget them. Because um, what I find is that if we if we if you interrupt if we interrupt the session for questions, then it becomes very long. And so what I would suggest is that you write questions down and then we ask them at the end. Okay? One other thing I would mention is the hundred dollar seats are down here. The ten dollar seats are in the back. I would invite you to come forward, come closer if you like. divided the theory for creation up into eight sessions, and so we'll be meeting every Sabbath from now until September 29th. Um, <clears throat> there are two major divisions to the theory for creation. In the first division, we're going to be looking at the world before the flood, and we're going to be looking at the existing evidence that tells us about what the world was like before the flood took place. And then in the second division, we are going to be talking about the theory for creation, the theory, its theory, that we came up with because of the evidence. Okay, so we're going to look at that. True faith is based on claims backed up by evidence. Remember Hebrews 11, 1 to 3, we looked at that this morning. Uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And... Um, False faith is based on claims without evidence. As we look at the evidence, you will see that the evidence all points to the seven-day creation week, six days of creation and Sabbath, and the worldwide flood. What I'm presenting is what I call the prima facie the apparent, the self-evident, that's what prima facie means, the apparent or the self-evident case for the literal seven-day creation week in the flood. Today I want to go over some of the purposes, and I start with this 1 Corinthians 2.5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The reason I say that is because there are many men who claim to be wise and they claim to know about the beginnings, the origins of the world, but they contradict the, the Bible, the scriptures. And if God is who he says he is, this cannot be true, correct? And we'll look at that and I'll show you that. Now there's a major premise and this is it. God is omnipotent which means all-powerful. He's omniscient, which means all-knowing. He's omnipresent, which means everywhere at once. Man cannot come even remotely close, regardless of his intellect, education, reading university degrees, knowledge, and experience. Therefore, we start with God, not with man. And we bring science to the Bible and measure it by God's standard and not vice versa. Many people start with men, but just think of who God is. And as you get to know how powerful he is, how all-knowing he is, you will always start with God. You will never start with men. In my personal experience, I have come across many, many men who were wise in their own eyes, but had 
received no wisdom from God. And if God is the source of wisdom and you don't have wisdom, remember James 1.5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So God is the source of wisdom. If you don't have wisdom from God, then what do you have? Remember the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right? Men with impressive degrees, position, and power. Don't listen to men. I'm going to start with three premises. You will see these over and over again because I think they're so important. Any theory must fit the Bible. It must fit the existing evidence. And it must follow the laws of science. The purpose is for the theory for creation. Why should we be, number one, number one, sorry, get me ahead of myself. Number one, to look at evidence for creation from the point of view of Christians who believe in God, the Bible, and science. Question, why believe the Bible? Have your Bible, or are there Bibles in the pew? Look up some text for me. Somebody look up Exodus 25:22. Someone look up Exodus 29:42. Someone look up Exodus 33:9 to 11. Someone look up Leviticus 1:1. 1, 1. Someone look up Numbers 7:89 and Numbers 12:78. Okay, that's a lot. Let's start. Exodus 25:22. Exodus 29.42, that's the next one. Who has Exodus 25.42?
Leviticus 1.1. One, one. He heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testament. From between the two of two cherubim, as he spoke to him. Right, again, who? God, talking to Moses from the mercy seat in the most holy place of the sanctuary, right? Numbers 12, 7, and 8. Last one. Numbers 12, 7, and 8. But this is not true of my servant Moses. His people are all in my house. With him, I speak face to face clearly, and not in the He sees the form of the Lord. And why then would you not be free to speak against my servant Moses? Yes. So again, the Lord speaking to Moses face to face. What was God doing? Do you realize that God was talking to Moses in an audible voice? Remember Israel had Urim and Thummim. They had the breastplate. And they had Urim and Thummim. And they cast lots. Remember that? But not so with Moses. The Bible teaches us clearly that God talked to Moses in an audible voice through the veil. Shekinah glory to Moses standing in the holy place. God talked to him like we're talking. I looked it up. I looked up two phrases. One phrase, and the Lord said to Moses. And the other phrase, and the Lord spoke to Moses. Those two phrases are used 161 times in the first five books of the Bible. Now tell me this. Are the first five books of the Bible accurate? Do you realize what we're saying? All during the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, whenever there was trouble, Moses went to the sanctuary and God talked to Moses from the Ark of the Covenant through the veil, Moses standing in the most holy place for 40 years. And Moses wrote it down. That's why we have the first five books of the Bible. Can we trust the Bible? I'm telling you, the first five books in the Bible must be the most accurate books in the Scriptures. And if you look back at the history of the Bible, all other books were tested by the first five books. Do you see the reason why? This is not Moses writing down his philosophy. This is not Moses writing down his opinion. This is Moses writing down what God told him. That's why we can trust the Bible. That's why we want to start with the Bible. That's why we want to start with God. We don't want to start with man. Because God talked to Moses in an audible voice. Moses wrote down what God said. The theory for creation is not a defense against evolution. Many people have done that. You can find websites like Answers in Genesis, which is Ken Ham, or uh, what's Kent Hovind's website? DrDino.com. Ken Hovind. Many people have done a defense. The Institute for Creation Research also done very powerful and very strong defenses against evolution. I didn't want to take that approach. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that creation is just the way God said it would be. Because God talked to Moses in an audible voice. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy must be accurate. Otherwise, God would have said to Moses, Oh, Moses, you got that wrong? Rewrite that. No, Moses got it right. He wrote down what God told him. Second purpose, to strengthen the faith of the children of God. Remember this morning we studied faith based on claims plus evidence, not faith based on claims alone. The devil has made many claims 
Among them, evolution. False faith, no evidence to back, back it up. Okay? Now I want to quote the text from Peter. First, I want to remind you, this is 2 Peter 3, I believe. First, I want to remind you that in the last days, there will be scoffers who will laugh, laugh at the truth and do every evil thing they desire. This will be their argument. Jesus promised to come back, did he? Then where is he? You hear anything like that today? Why, as far back as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of his command, and he brought the earth up from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the world with a mighty flood. And God has also commanded that the heavens and the earth will be consumed by fire on the day of judgment when ungodly people will perish. I'm just going to back up because I have a note from the other one. If you look at the phrase, everything has remained exactly the same since the world was first created. That is the uniformitarian theory. I don't know if you've heard that before. The uniformitarian theory is that things are cyclical, but they basically have remained the same for millions and millions of years. Everything carries on the same as it always has. I'm going to look at many examples, but one that we're going to consider is carbon-14. They believe that carbon-14 has always been formed at the same rate, consumed at the same rate, decayed at the same rate as it does now. And I'll show you that this is not true. The earth was surrounded by water. Remember that phrase. The earth was surrounded by water. Now, the devil has proposed origins for the world and the way he talks about the world, the origins of the world, he talks first of, he claims, this is his claim, right, false faith, he claims that the earth started with molten rock, right, molten rock, so the earth started with fire, and then it rained, and then the minerals flowed into the sea, remember all that, and then the, he is claiming now that because of global warming, that the world is going to be destroyed by a flood. But what does God say? Remember Genesis? And the earth was without form and void, and uh, the Spirit hovered over the water. Um, and so, what does God say? The world started with water, and how is it going to end? With fire. That's exactly the opposite of what the devil has said. The devil says it started with fire, it's going to end with water. And God says it started with water, it's going to end with fire. To plant a seed in the minds of young people. According to the SDA Value Genesis study, we are losing a large majority of our young people. Many leave when they, are find, when they find they are bombarded with evolution and do not have an alternative explanation for the existing evidence. Hopefully the seed will grow and they will remember that all of the evidence points to creation and the flood and stay with or return to God. To present a biblically based, scientifically accurate explanation of the existing evidence, a large number of so-called Christians are beginning to believe in long ages, progressive creation, the gap theory, the day age theory. This destroys the plan of salvation, undermines the entire Bible, including Jesus, I'll show you. To show that God is the author and designer of all scientific laws. Remember how we tell if a law is God's? How do we know if a law is God's? Man cannot change it. Man can change his own laws, but we cannot change the laws of God. Okay? So if we hear of a law, if you hear about the law, of this, the second law of thermodynamics, or if you hear about the law of gravity, or if you hear about uh, the, the um, photosynthesis, the law of photosynthesis, or you know the laws of chemistry, the laws of any.
any science are God's laws because man cannot change them. Okay, and so we can test, is it God's law or is it man's law? Now, if these laws are God's laws, can they be out of harmony with the one who created them? They cannot be. Right? So, many people look at science and say, well, science is in opposition to God. No, it's not. Men are in opposition to God. But science has to be in harmony with God. Because all the laws are His. He's the one who created them. He's the one who made them. So it's men. It's the theory of evolution. It's those are out of harmony with God, yes. But science is not out of harmony with God. God is the one who created the scientific laws. <clears throat> For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. False science. So the, according to the Bible, there's true science and false science. And the false science, the true science, are the laws of God, the, including the laws of science and math. Could any man be given such attributes? Only God is omnipotent and omniscient. So that's why we want to start with God and not with man. Here's what the Bible has to say. 1 Corinthians 3, 19-21. For the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of the scientists of this world, is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men. Give this some serious thought. Think about this. 1 Corinthians 1.25 Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Can we trust in the wisdom of men? The foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. John 5, 43 and 44. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? What is Jesus talking about here? Anybody see? What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about experts. Don't you see? He's talking about men who receive honor from other men. He's talking about men who go to educational institutions and receive PhDs. They've been honored by other men. But they haven't sought honor from God. Jesus is talking about the experts. And yet, we refuse to believe in what Jesus says. We refuse to believe in God's word in the Bible, what God told Moses. Science versus science falsely so-called. We must learn to distinguish between true science and science falsely so-called, false science. God is the author and designer of all sciences and their individual laws. And there are many, many sciences now. You know, the main ones we know about, chemistry, biology, physics, math. But now there's photobiology and um, uh, radiation medicine, and, you know, you can go on and on. There's so many different sciences. All the laws that govern those sciences are God's laws. True science follows God's laws. These are all true, objective, testable, reliable, faithful, and repeatable, regardless of time or place. So, for example, the law of photosynthesis. Do you know anywhere in the world where the law of photosynthesis doesn't work? Everyone has to breathe air, correct? And the law of photosynthesis says that green plants are going to take carbon dioxide and water, use sunlight, and create food and 
Oxygen. That's the law of photosynthesis. Is there anywhere in the world it doesn't work? This is God's law. How about the laws of chemistry? Just some examples, okay? If you take sodium ions and chlorine ions and mix them together, what will you get? Salt. Is there anywhere in the world where you can mix this reaction and not get salt? Can you go somewhere and mix sodium ions and chlorine ions and get gold? <laughs> God's laws are testable, faithful, and repeatable. They're reliable, right? They're repeatable, regardless of time or place. Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The Bible describes these as false science. To show that the theory of evolution began with Satan, did you know that he was the originator of the theory of evolution? What does the theory of evolution teach? I hear whispers. <laughs> Sorry? God is dead, yes, it does teach that. But doesn't the theory of evolution teach that creatures, that animals, are progressively improving, progressively getting better, progressively getting higher, going from a lower order to higher order? Isn't that what evolution teaches? Remember this from Isaiah 14. Isaiah is talking about the king of Babylon, but the king of Babylon represents the devil, and here's what God has to say about him. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Think about that. This is evolution. Exactly. You can become something where a lower order being is moving to a higher order. Satan wanted to be like God. He's the one who started the theory for evolution. He continued this with Adam and Eve. Remember his statement to them? you will be like gods. He's telling them you can evolve. If you, eat the tree, if you eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like gods. You can move up. Theory of evolution started with the devil. <clears throat> to demonstrate that the seven-day creation week is inextricably linked to the Ten Commandments and to the rest of the Bible, here is the fourth commandment. Remember, the Sab remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And then I left out a few words. And then what does it say? For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. Then he rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. So what's the reason for worshiping on Sabbath? Isn't it to remember creation? The Sabbath, the, seven, the seventh day, the Sabbath that God hallowed, he set aside as a memorial for creation. Now think about this for a minute. There are billions of people in the world. I think, I'm not positive on this number, but I think that the number of Christians is about one billion. Okay? Not... Don't quote me for the accuracy, but it's somewhere around one billion Christians in the world. How often do they worship? Now, you know, granted what I'm saying, Sabbath is the correct day to worship, no question. Many of them worship on Sunday, but how often do they worship? Every week. Why? Because it's the memorial for creation. That's why they worship every week. That's why they don't worship once every three months or once a year or some other interval every two days. It's because Sabbath is a memorial for creation. 
This is one of the greatest evidences for the seven-day creation week. John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Did John believe in creation? Absolutely. That's what he's talking about. Where did he get it from? Genesis. Yes? He got it from Genesis. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is talking about Jesus. Luke 16, 21. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking about? The leaders of the Jewish church. And what is he saying? If they don't believe Moses, then neither will they believe if one is raised from the dead. And remember, not long after he said this, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Did they believe when Lazarus was raised from the dead? You know what we're told? They refused to believe, and they tried to kill Lazarus to cover up the evidence. They were plotting to kill Jesus, and they decided they were going to kill Lazarus to cover up the evidence that Jesus had raised him from the dead. You realize what I'm showing you? I'm showing you texts in the Bible where Jesus is saying, look, I believe in Moses. Moses, we're talking about the first five books of Moses. John believes in Moses. Do you, you see what I'm saying? If, you, if we <clears throat> undermine Genesis 1 to 11, which many Christians are now doing, many Christians are now saying Genesis 1 to 11 is a metaphor, or it's a fable, or it's just... A, a story way of telling about creation is not literally true. If we do that, we're undermining Jesus, we're undermining John, we're undermine, we, could, we would undermine David, and so on and so forth, okay? <clears throat> for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Again, he's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Jesus believed in the stories of creation, of Noah and the flood, and of the creation of the first couple. He quoted Genesis 2.24 and Matthew 19.5. Let's just look those up quickly. Somebody look up Mark 10.6. Somebody look up Matthew 24.37-39. And somebody look up Genesis, I'm sorry, somebody look up Matthew 19.5. Yes, please. Mark ten six. You have next one. Matthew nineteen five. Okay. In Matthew nineteen four, heaven you read. He replied that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So what does Jesus believe here? What is Jesus talking about? Creation of Adam and Eve. Correct? Who has... This is... Is it Genesis 1 or Genesis 2? Right there, beginning. Who has uh, um, Matthew 20, 24, 37 to 39? Sorry, David? Mark 10.6, yeah, go ahead, read it, please. It says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Right. 
And who has Matthew 24, 37 to 39? Someone have that? Yes, please. Right. So from these texts, what do we find? Jesus believed in creation. And he believed in the flood. The text that Bob just read, that's the flood. Jesus believed in creation and the flood, exactly as Mo- Moses had written it. If we undermine Genesis 1-11, to what do we do with Jesus? Do you see what happens? We destroy the credibility of Jesus himself. Genesis 1 to 11 is literally true. The fool, Psalms 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I want to just do a few um, phrases, a few quotes from selected messages. <clears throat> I'll just briefly relate why I went to selected messages and uh, It was very interesting because the Holy Spirit pointed me to Selected Messages, Book 3. There's a chapter called Science and Revelation. I forget the chapter number. I think it's 30 or 31. Science and Revelation. I shared not this much information, but an abbreviated version of the theory for creation at an Adventist university, which I will not name. At that meeting was a PhD professor in the Department of Chemistry who told me that he believed that the world was hundreds of thousands of years old. Do you know that I lost sleep over that professor? I had gone Let me say this carefully. (laughs) I have known this guy for a long time. He's a PhD in chemistry. He has taught many students. They've gone through his classes. And he doesn't believe in the literal seven-day creation week. Isn't this a problem? We are trying to work on ways to keep our young people in the church. And one of the strongest things that drives them out of the church is evolution. And we have professors in our university teaching them that the world is not six or 7,000 years old, but rather hundreds of thousands of years old. Isn't this a problem? Wow. And the Holy Spirit pointed me to Selected Messages, Book 3. I mean, yes, Book 3. Selected Messages, Book 3. Science and Revelation. Here are a few thoughts. Test science by the word of God, she says. There should be a settled faith in the divinity of God's word. And remember what I just showed you. Moses got the first five books because God talked to him in an audible voice, face to face, as a man talks to his friend through the veil from the Shekinah glory in the earthly sanctuary for 40 years. There should be settled faith in the divinity of God's word. Can God work above his laws? The author of nature's laws can work above those laws. Notice this carefully. He can work above the laws, but he doesn't change them. And he doesn't work against them. All right? God's character interpreted by his works. Those who judge him from his handiworks and not from the suppositions of great men, will see his presence in everything. Science, an aid to understand God. Remember we were talking about a lot of people thinking that science and God are in opposition. No, not true. All the systems of philosophy devised by men have led to confusion and shame when God has not been recognized and honored. God, the designer and creator. The Lord commands things into being. He was the first designer. 
All things stood up before him at his voice. In the formation of our world, God was not beholden to pre-existent substance or matter. In other words, ex nihilo creation. Ex nihilo creation. Anybody know what that means? Out of nothing. It means there might be nothing there, and God could say, let there be a bird, and a bird will appear. God is the only one who can do that. Ex nihilo creation. So those are some thoughts from Ellen White. Now I want to just briefly show you <clears throat> what we're going to study, because what we've gone over today is the purposes for the theory for creation and the relationship between God and science. Do you see that God and science are in harmony? They're not out of harmony. It's men who are out of harmony with God. Now I want to show you what we're going to look at next. So we're going to look at the existing evidence. Existing evidence is there now. If you want to, you can go and check it out. You can go and go to these places, you can go to museums, you can go to these places. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can smell it, taste it, okay? We're going to look at the existing evidence. We're going to look at mammoths, the quantity of fossil fuels on Earth, subtropical Arctic and Antarctic regions. Right now, subarctic and Antarctic are not subtropical, correct? Follow that. The megafauna and large dinosaurs. The word megafauna means what? Mega means what? Big. So fauna is mm, animals. Yeah. So we're talking about big animals, megafauna, big animals, and large dinosaurs. Amber with bubbles containing nearly 35% oxygen. Much longer life from the Bible. How long did people live before the flood? 900 plus. Okay, I'll show you a chart that shows that. Living fossils, we talked about that a little bit this morning. We're going to look at more. I'll show you a number of living fossils. I'll show you pictures of the living fossil. Water above and below the firmament. No rain before the flood. George F. Dodwell, Australian government astronomer. And evidence for an ice age post-flood. So these are the things that we'll look at. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Bob. <clears throat> I call it the theory because it can't be proven. And if you look at how men describe things, we start out with a thought, okay? And a thought has no evidence necessarily, it's just my thought, okay? It's my opinion. Then we progress to a hypothesis. A hypothesis is I'm beginning to see some evidence that uh, there may be some validity to my thought, but it's still not very concrete, okay? And then the next progression is theory. And when you reach theory, now there's evidence for what is presented, for what is shared. Now, we can only call it theory because what you'll find is you can't prove that this is so. You know, uh, Ken Ham asked this question, were you there? You know, dinosaurs lived before the flood. Were you there? You know, in other words, we're looking at opposing claims. We're looking at the devil's claim saying dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and God's claim that says they lived just before the flood and just after, so 4,000 years ago. All right? Can you prove that that? dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? No, you can't. Can you prove that they lived before the flood? Well, yes, we can, but it's not, you know, in other words, you can't prove, there's no absolute proof for creation or for the flood, and so, I mean, for evolution. 
But what we need to do, what we want to do, is we want to look at the existing evidence. Remember what we did this morning. We want to look at the claims and the evidence. And in my study, what I've found is there are lots of claims from the devil's side, lots of claims, no evidence. I haven't found any evidence at all. But for God's side, lots of claims, lots of evidence. The thing is that we need to look at the evidence through biblical glasses, understanding what we know, that God talked to Moses in an audible voice from the most holy place in the earthly sanctuary for 40 years while they were wandering in the wilderness. God spoke to him. That makes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy a fairly trustworthy source. Excuse me, wrong adjective. A very trustworthy source. (laughs) Correct? Yeah, that's the reason why. But notice that I call it the theory for, capital for creation. It's not the theory against evolution. This is the theory for creation. Any other questions? Yes. Right. So, so right now, I suddenly become aware of that. But somehow the Bible is saying that it just came at one point in time. And it's not that far away. Right. And that's what we're going to look at. As we progress through this, you will see that really the Bible is accurate. And we understand this. The guy who came up with the 6,000-year time frame was Bishop Usher. I don't know if you know his name. He went through the Bible, through the genealogies, recorded who lived, how long, then had a son, then lived so long, then died, you know? <laughs> the genealogies are all like that, right? Bishop Usher went through and recorded all these people, and he said, okay, if you look at Adam, he lived 130 years, then, you know, he lived till 930, and so on. And so he said, if I add up all the times, the world is 6,000 years old. But I want to let you know that there are some gaps that he can't account for, okay? In other words, in many cases, the lives overlapped. In the cases where there's overlap, there's no question that that period of time is correct. But there are cases where the life of this person ends, and then the life of this person begins, but there's no overlap. So we don't know.